Question 9 from Section 2 of the 2019 Higher Physics Examination. A laser emits light when electrons are stimulated to fall from a higher energy level to a lower energy level. The diagram shows some of the energy levels involved. In one particular laser, a photon is produced by the electron transition from E5 to E3 as shown. And for four marks, we're asked to determine the wavelength of the photon emitted. Now, we know that when the electron moves from one level down to another level, it's going to give off a photon. And that photon is going to have energy E. And the value of that energy E is exactly equal to the energy gap between the two energy levels, delta E. So we can say the following. We can say that delta E, the energy gap, will be the energy of the photon. And it's equal to H f where h is Planck's constant and f is the frequency the photon produced. Now we're asked to find the wavelengths. We've got to change the frequency into the wavelength and we know that we can write delta e this time equal to h c divided by lambda. These are the two energy equations involving Planck's constant you must know. Where do we get that c divided by lambda from? Well we know that the frequency is going to be equal to v divided by lambda and in this case, the V, the velocity of the light, is C. So we can change that to the constant C. And we just swap in the frequency to get delta E equals HC divided by lambda. So now we know that, then we can just simply rearrange to find out what the wavelength is. So if we cross multiply, we're going to have delta E times lambda is going to equal to HC. And therefore, lambda on its own is going to equal to HC all divided by delta E. So we've just got to find this delta E value. Now, when you look at an energy level diagram, don't worry about the minus signs. Or don't get involved in subtracting one minus sign from another because you can make mistakes that way. The minus sign is there just to indicate that that's the amount of energy needed for the electron if it was on that energy level to escape the atom or to be ionized. So for example, if you're an electron sitting at energy level E3, then you need 3.290 times 10 to the minus 18 joules to escape the atom. So don't worry about the minus signs. If you're working out delta E, all we have to do is just take the big number away from the small number. So in this case, it's 3.290 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. Take away the smaller number, 2.976 times 10 to the minus 18. And we get an answer there of 3.14, if we do this in our calculator, 3.14 times 10, and it's going to give us minus 19 joules on our calculator. So that is the energy difference delta E. Now let's plug the numbers into our equation. We have found out previously that to find the wavelength, all we have to do is do this. Wavelength lambda is going to equal to hc, where h is Planck's constant, c is the speed of light, divided by the energy difference in the energy levels. So Planck's constant is going to give you a value of 6.63, if you look it up into the data book, times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds, multiplied by the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the power 8 meters per second, put a bracket around that, and we're dividing by the energy gap, which we've just worked out, the energy difference between the two energy levels, which was 3.14 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So we do that in a calculator. We end up with 6.33 times 10 to the minus 7 of a metre. And you can check units here because joules cancel out with joules. The seconds cancel out the seconds, you're left with just a metre. So that will be the wavelength of the photon emitted from that transition. We can show off and put in nanometers. It's 633 nanometers, one nanometer being one times 10 to minus nine. So that's the wavelength of the photon emitted. Question nine, part A continued and it's part two. The laser beam is shown onto a screen and the beam produces a spot of diameter 8.00 times 10 to minus 4 meters. You can see from the diagram that a spot of laser light and you are shown the diameter 8.00 times 10 to minus 4 meters. 
The irradiance of the spot of light on the screen is 9,950 watts per metre square. And for four marks, we're asked to determine the power of the laser beam. Well, we do know that the irradiance of light is equal to the power arriving at a certain area, per unit area. So we can rearrange that to give us that the power of the laser is going to be equal to I, the radians, times the area. And we also know that the area is equal to pi r squared, so we've got the radians times pi times r squared. So we know all these, but we know the diameter is 8 times 10 to the minus 4, so we know the diameter is equal to 8 times 10 to the minus 4, 8.00 times 10 to the minus 4 of a metre, but be careful, the radius has got to be equal to half of that, 4.00 times 10 to the minus 4 of a metre. So therefore then, plug the numbers in, the power is going to be equal to the radiance, which we are told is 9,950 watts per metre squared, multiplied by the area, which is pi, which we'll put in pi for that, times the radius squared, which is 4.00, times 10 to minus 4, all squared, and that's going to give you a metre squared in there. The two metre squares are going to cancel out to give you power watts, and if we do that on a calculator, we end up with 5.00 times 10 to minus 3 of a watt, and we can convert that into milliwatts as 5 milliwatts. There's your four marks. Question 9b. A student investigates how a radians I varies with distance D from a point source of light, using the apparatus shown. We have a small lamp, we have a light sensor attached to a light meter, which is possibly maybe a voltmeter, and we have a bench covered with black cloth, and we've got a meter stick. And for three marks, we're asked to describe how this apparatus could be used to verify the inverse square law for a point source of light. Now, the inverse square law is given as I, the radians, is directly proportional to 1 upon D squared. That's where we get the inverse square law from. So all we have to do in this situation is vary the point source of light from the light sensor, record the distance it is from the light sensor, and also record the irradians, which is, of course, matching up with the the number of the voltmeter or the light meter if it's attached and calibrated. So vary the distance, record the distance, record the irradians, and we put everything into a table. So to finally get the relationship, we'd have to do the following quick experiment. We'd have to, do number one, obtain the irradians values for different distances using your ruler and the little light meter. We would record the data in a table. We would plot 1 upon distance squared. So what we have here then is we'd have the distance, but we change it into 1 upon distance squared. And we plot that against the value for the specific irradiance. Then what we do after that is that we, if the graph is plotted and it's a straight line through the origin, then we can conclusively say that we have an inverse square law is proved. It must be a straight line, and it must be through the origin before we can say that the radians i is directly proportional to 1 upon d squared, which would be the inverse square law. Mm -hmm.